Gaunts are a genre that I have a weird relationship with. I really like the concept of wandering around open areas and collecting stuff for as long as I want, but I notice that I tend to really dislike the execution in most games. Super Mario 64? Well, it was amazing for its time, and even nowadays it can be satisfying to master the game's acrobatics. But the air controls are extremely stiff, and many of the stars are very annoying, and half of the levels are actual garbage. A hat in time? Well, the game is extremely charming and the controls are perfectly functional, but most hats are extremely situational and the game's progression is extremely restricted in a way that doesn't really play to the genre's strengths. Ape Escape? Well, I adored the idea of the game's main collectibles being living beings that all think differently and react to you in their own ways. But the controls are a bit too stiff to my taste, and the game kinda discourages 100% completion despite there being a reward for it. Banjo-Kazooie? Three words. Note. Scoring. System. The only collectathon I can say I genuinely like is Spiral 1. Not the Spyro Trilogy, just Spiral 1. The reason for that is because in Spyro 2, you had to do all of these boring missions that involve boring tasks like fishing, escorting, playing hockey, and solving puzzles. In Spyro 3, you had a lot of these minigames that had nothing to do with the main gameplay loop and just made you rip your hair out at their worst. None of that bullshit is in Spyro 1. You just get in a level, wander around, collect the things, and go away based shit right there. And because the game is entirely focused in its main gameplay loop of charging, flying, and spitting fire at everyone, the 100% completion experience ends up consisting mostly of looking at locations from far away and thinking, well, I wonder if I can get there, then trying for half an hour, then finally doing it, then feeling like an absolute chat. The reason I'm telling all of this is because when it comes to collectathons, Reignited Spyro 1 is the standard I compare all other collectathons to. It's a game with a focus on X exploration and mastery of the player's controls, with very little fluff in between. And that's when Yellow Taxi Goes Room comes in. This is a game that checks all of the boxes I just mentioned. It's a game with extremely fun and responsive controls, exploration-focused level design, and a profound confidence in the concept of collecting stuff for the sake of it. This game is currently still in development, but it got a Steam Next Fest demo for everyone to enjoy, and I love it. So much, in fact, that I spent nine hours collecting everything! NINE HOURS IN A DEMO! So, let's go through all of these boxes together, shall we? Starting with the first one, this game's controls can be described as unorthodox, but responsive. Let's take a look at Metroid, for example. In what other game can you become invincible by jumping? What other game allows you to double crouch and just wander around as a ball that poops other balls? What other game allows you to run as fast as Sonic, control X your speed, and then control V it in whatever direction you want? There is a lot of platformer conventions that games just tend to copy endlessly, and yet Metroid is still a very unique franchise to this day. It's unorthodox enough to never become the norm, yet it still clicks somehow. That is how I feel about Yellow Taxi Goes Vroom. It's a game that lacks some of the supposedly fundamental aspects of platformers, but it still works. And the most obvious thing to point out is that jumping in this game simply doesn't work the way you would think. Hell, you might even spend a whole hour without knowing you can even jump. It all revolves around this mechanic called flip a will. The way it works is very simple. You press spacebar, that makes you do a flip, and right afterwards you gain a speed boost. But you can also press spacebar again to interrupt your flipple wheel, which also gives you a short air hop. That's the closest thing you have to a traditional jump in this game. This might sound very restrictive, but because of how the levels are designed, it doesn't end up being a problem at all. It's also not the only way you have to gain altitude. You can also perform a backflip. Now, for the nature of it being a backflip, trying to use it on its own can get very repetitive and clunky. So, if you want a high enough jump that sends you forward, you can chain a backflip, then a mid-air interruption. But hey, instead of some height, you might want some distance. In this case, you just interrupt the flipple will after the speed boost starts. 
This gives you a significant air distance, and you can do one late interruption in the ground, then another one in the air. It's basically a double dash. Do you think the Super Mario 64 styled acrobatics are too boring? Don't worry, because they also added Sonic to that shit. The angle of the slopes you're standing on affect the trajectory of your flip will And with that, you can just rocket yourself out towards any place you want as long as there's a ramp around. And you guessed it, you can do a backflip or an interruption after boosting off a slope. This game is a masterpiece. This game makes extremely simple tasks far more complicated than they ever needed to be. But they make this complication so fun it wraps around and becomes charming. And it's not only acrobatic, but fast-paced and frenetic. So that's box number one. So what about the level design? Well, I don't know exactly where to start, so I'll just list the things I like about it. I really like how small most of the levels feel. In a game like Super Mario 64, a lot of the levels can oftentimes feel huge and expansive, and the maps themselves only got bigger and bigger with each new Mario collectathon. In this game, you start with the impression that the levels are huge, but the more you play, the smaller they feel. There are some exceptions, sure, but Overall, most stages can be easily zoomed through if you're skilled enough with the controls. Because of that, everything in the stage is almost immediately accessible to you. Collecting all of the items in the stage isn't a matter of traversing through long platforming sections, but rather just a matter of knowing where everything is. And oh boy, these guys did a good job at hiding those items. Most of them are placed in plain sight, but others are hidden in ways that feel extremely clever. The game does a great job at using the mechanics at its disposal to hide items, and a good example is... Water. Water literally doesn't have any effect on how the taxi controls its purely aesthetic, but you can only see what's underwater if you're underwater, which is a great way to hide items that otherwise will be perfectly visible. This might sound a little bullshit, but the game does a good job at communicating that sometimes there's ground to stand on underwater. And when the items aren't hidden, they're placed in locations that require a good understanding of the game's controls to reach them. Like I mentioned with Spyro 1, there are several places that if you can wonder if you can reach them, you probably can. All of these factors combined result in what's probably my favorite aspect about this game. You can collect everything in a stage the first time you're getting through it. That's a problem that plagues the original Spyro trilogy, except, you guessed it, Spyro 1. The game! Ah! Spyro 2 has unlockable abilities and Spyro 3 has unlockable characters, and in both games, some collectibles are gated behind those unlockables. That means in most stages, you can't get everything they have right away and are required to backtrack later, which to me just comes across as unnecessary padding. Spyro 1 doesn't have any unlockables, so it simply doesn't have that problem. And it's blissful. It's so satisfying to get everything in a stage, and it's so agonizing when a game doesn't allow me to do that. <laughs> in the Taxi Games case, it's still in development, so that might change in the future. Please don't fucking change it. But right now, whether or not you can collect everything in a stage purely depends on how well you understand the game's controls. There's a lot of hidden skills the game doesn't tell you how to do right away, but they're all available since the beginning. So you have this middle ground between constantly learning new abilities over time, like you're unlocking them, while simultaneously being able to collect everything right away. And there's an extra benefit to that approach, which is finding out about skills on your own. Hell, I found out about backflips by myself while messing around with the controls. And while the game does tell you that you can interrupt your flip of wills, the game never tells you that you can do it shortly after you get the speed boost. So there's a genuine element of discovery by just messing around with the game, and that's extremely satisfying. Another thing that I want to mention before we move on is how every stage in the game is filled to the brim with ramps. Remember I told you ramps affect the angle of your flip of will? Well, that's some pretty useful information, because ramps are everywhere. Every hill has lobes. The rocks on top of the ocean have slopes. Even the fucking houses are shaped in this wacky, crooked way just so you can flip a will on top of them. I love it!
This game does genuinely feel like if Super Mario 64 and Classic Sonic had a baby together, it's incredible. And that's Box 2. At the beginning of the video, I said that I didn't like how Ahead in Time handled its progression. Here's what I mean. In Super Mario 64, arguably the first collectathon ever made, every single star from any level you had unlocked was available from the start for you to collect. You had to choose a specific star to start the level, but for the most part, you could aim for a different star halfway through if you so desired. In Ahead in Time, the hourglass you pick up before you start the level is the only hourglass that will appear in said level. Not only that, but not all hourglasses are available right away. You start with only one or two available, then you have to collect them to unlock more hourglasses to get. Ahead in Time doesn't feel like it's structured like a collectathon. It feels like it's structured like a linear platformer with some collectibles across the way. The open worlds aren't actually open, they feel more like excuses to save development time by recycling the same level over and over again. Hell, you're even kicked out of the level after collecting an hourglass, you know, the one thing no one likes about Mario 64. In the end, Ahead of Time just doesn't feel committed to the idea of collecting stuff for the sake of it. And that's where Yellow Taxi Goes Vroom shines the most. The levels are all completely open for a reason. They are all yours to explore and unravel at your own pace in your own way. They challenge you by keeping your eyes keen for every corner and placing collectibles in places that take skill to reach. In this game, gears are this game's stars slash hourglass slash capture dragon slash you get the fucking book. You know what happens when you get a gear? You go on of your adventure like nothing happened because the game knows there's still more to collect than the level. That's amazing to me because I always thought this genre worked best when it was designed like a sandbox rather than a curated level or a GTA open world with side quests. The game does absolutely nothing to shake the gameplay off other than establish new platforming mechanics for you to play around with, because it is confident that collecting stupid shit that isn't worth anything is enough to entertain you for multiple hours. And that is the one aspect of the game that turns Yellow Taxi Goes Vroom from a good game to one of the most BASE games I've ever played. Of course, the game having great controls, good level design, and a lot of charm definitely elevates it to greater heights, but this simple profound confidence in collecting stuff for the sake of it is what ultimately sells it for me. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is Box 3. Thanks for watching. Oh my god, I'm finally done with this video. I can finally move on to Soto Regalia. Okay, we can finally go to my favorite part of this... of this demo, which is this place. Jim Gears. It's a Sigma male gym with funk music. That's the best thing ever. I have like, I... I absolutely do not give a shit that this is gonna age like milk in like, in the next five years. I do not care, this is amazing. I'm gonna be like an adult and like, kids are gonna play this game. Like, I'm gonna be like, uh, like a 40 year old man and kids are gonna like, look back at this game and like, Oh, this game is so unbased with its cringe culture from the past, and I was like, no, the you don't you don't get it, kid. That that was like the most goaded thing ever back then.